Throughout the many conflicts that have occurred since the arrival of Tiberium on Earth, the prevailing victors of these conflicts, that being the Global Defense Initiative, would have many people believe that their weapons, technology, and equipment is far superior to that of the Brotherhoods. And while that notion might be true in a general sense, the reality is not so distinct. One area in particular that the Brotherhood has managed to always maintain superiority in is with technology involving lasers. Laser being an acronym for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. This beam of light is created when a laser medium, such as particles and special glasses, crystals, or gases, absorb energy from an energy source, usually electrical, which causes the particles to turn from a basic state into a stimulated state. When these particles revert back to their basic state, they emit photons. If these photons hit other stimulated particles, they cause them to emit more photons. Energy is continuously introduced to the laser medium, stimulating the particles to continuously emit more and more photons, which are then reflected by mirrors increasing them further. One of the mirrors has a hole in it, which allows some of the photons to escape as a beam of light one that can be reflected and directed by additional mirrors. Of course, lasers are used for many practical civilian purposes, such as barcode scanners, pointers, and disc readers. But they also have military applications as well, such as shooting down missiles and aircraft. Thanks to the Brotherhood's secret connections to many defense contractors before and during the First Tiberium War, they were able to further develop various weapons, vehicles, and structures that could make use of lasers as powerful and effective force multipliers on the battlefield. Even after the First War, they were able to continue making improvements to these weapon systems, leading up to and through the Second and Third Tiberium Wars. One of the first and most common applications for Nod laser systems is seen in the form of base defenses, the most basic of which are laser fences. These fences were first made use of during the later stages of the First Tiberium War, typically surrounding either an entire base or just important buildings, such as Cain's Temple in Cairo, Egypt. These fences would prevent any soldiers, whether they be GDI or Nod, from entering the base compound or specific structure that they surround. If any infantry were to try and walk through the laser fence, they would be severely injured or even killed due to the burns that they would receive from the beams themselves. At least, that's what I assume they would do, but walking into them in Renegade does nothing but block the player from moving past the barrier. The design of the laser fence remained mostly the same over the years, though during the Second Tiberium War, it did have a more unique look. With electrical pylons which look reminiscent of a Tesla coil acting as links for the beams, if one of these pylons is destroyed, it creates a hole in the fence that infantry and vehicles can pass through unharmed. It's also important for Nod commanders to make sure that they have enough power to keep the fences functioning at all times. By the time of the Third Tiberium War, the laser fences were almost exclusively used to surround individual buildings, rather than being wrapped around an entire base. The pylons went back to a slim design and seemed to be self-powered as well, not needing to rely on power plants in order to function. Of course, the downside of all laser fences is that it doesn't take much to destroy them, and they are completely incapable of actually returning fire and repelling a full-scale enemy assault. For those situations, the Brotherhood rely on the most powerful defensive structure in their arsenal, the Obelisk of Light. This laser tower was one of several secret weapons developed by the Brotherhood before the First Tiberium War. It seems to have been developed under the code name Project Obelisk, a name which pops up during the EVA installation sequence for Tiberian Dawn. The first version of the structure was a thin sloped back tower resembling a scorpion tail, with a large focusing crystal at the top. As to where Nod acquired these crystals, my guess is that they could have been gathered from crystal deposits, or gems as they were more commonly known at the time, seen during the Second World War between the Allies and Soviet Union. Although crystals can also be manufactured, which is another possibility for how Nod acquires them for use in the obelisk, and perhaps even other laser weaponry in their arsenal. The structure was fully autonomous, and was equipped with sensors that allowed it to detect enemy troops and vehicles within its range. It powers up its laser and fires at a single target. This laser beam is capable of killing infantry and light vehicles in one blast, and severely damaging heavier vehicles. 
It could even fire over high walls, or even other base structures, thanks to its height. For many enemy combatants, the sound of the obelisk charging up and firing is the last thing they will hear right before their demise. Thanks to Renegade, we get a good idea of how this powering up process occurs. It starts with capacitors underground, which are directly below the obelisk tower itself. These capacitors generate the light energy. The generated light is then focused at a single point on the floor in the middle of the room. It is then dispersed through four tubes that lead upward toward the structure on the surface. An elevator leads up to the second level catwalk, where the four tubes meet at the center of the roof on their way upward. Another elevator leads to the surface interior of the structure. Outside, the four tubes carrying the light become external, with two tubes on each side of the obelisk. I'm not sure why you would want these tubes to be exposed like this, as it creates an obvious target for DDI forces to focus fire on. Perhaps it's a way of venting the heat given off by the light as it travels through the tubes. Though they do then return to the inside of the structure, where they converge in the middle, allowing the light to build up inside the focusing crystal, where it is then fired at the nearest enemy combatant or vehicle. Though as powerful as the obelisk was, it did have its weaknesses. The first being the cost and construction of it, and the amount of power that was needed in order to keep it functioning at all times. The second was its lack of range and slow recharge time. Long-range artillery and air vehicles could destroy the obelisk outside the structure's firing range, and if no artillery or air support is available, a mass amount of ground forces could swarm the tower and destroy it quickly, before it could do a large amount of damage. Even with these weaknesses, however, the obelisk was still an intimidating sight on the battlefield. Just like with the laser fence, the obelisk of light also saw a change in its design around the time of the Second Tiberium War. This new version of the obelisk had a wider base that included two bunkers on the back of it. One bunker was located at the ground level and also acted as the entrance inside the structure itself, and the other was located on the back of the tower closer to the focusing crystal. These changes made the obelisk more durable compared to its predecessor from the first war. One could even tell when the obelisk was powered on due to the small light on the front of the structure moving from side to side. I always interpreted this as part of the scanner system built into the structure that it uses to detect approaching enemy units. The Brotherhood were not the only ones to make use of obelisk technology during the Second Tiberium War, though. In fact, the mutants known as the Forgotten had managed to take control of one and use it in order to defend one of their bases from Nod forces that were using GDI vehicles. And during the final assault on Cabal's core at the end of the Firestorm Crisis, the AI was able to re-engineer and develop its own versions of the obelisk, which I plan to go into more detail about in a future video. By the time of the Third Tiberium War, the obelisk went through another redesign, which was more reminiscent of the original, except that it was not as blocky, and the focusing crystal at the top was longer and thinner. The entrance was on the back, or I guess actually the front of the structure, since right above the entrance is the scanner which can detect stealth units. No matter the direction the structure is facing, it still destroys almost anything that enemies can throw at it. The tower also has been upgraded to discharge two different kinds of beams. The first is the standard charge beam, which focuses on a single vehicle, usually strong enough to destroy said vehicle in one blast. And the second is an uncharged attack that is used against infantry. While this uncharged beam is less powerful than the charged one, it does last longer, allowing the tower to sweep the beam across multiple lines of infantry in order to cut them down. Due to the monetary and power expenses associated with building an obelisk of light, not commanders wanted a defensive laser weapon that was more affordable, while at the same time still able to effectively hold off enemy forces attacking their base. This resulted in the invention of the laser turret, which was first seen in action during the Second Tiberium War. This turret was built above ground, but could be kept in an underground hole, where it would pop up to engage enemy units within its vicinity, able to effectively take out light vehicles and infantry with a few blasts. The turret could also rotate 360 degrees in order to engage targets in all directions, and unlike the obelisk, it doesn't appear to use a focusing crystal for its laser beams, though the crystal could be inside the turret itself, and not external. The weapon is weaker compared to the obelisk, and has a shorter range as well, which means that even vehicles like the Titan Mark I could destroy the turret just right outside its field of fire. The Brotherhood upgraded their laser turrets, as well as other defensive systems, sometime before the Third Tiberium War. 
Instead of the laser turret being a single gun, it was now three turrets armed with two pairs of lasers. And all three turrets were connected to a central hub that powered, repaired, and rebuilt the turrets if they were damaged or destroyed. As to how exactly the central hub rebuilds the turrets, I'm not sure. It could just be a function of gameplay, but if I had to take a guess, it could be that the hub sends out miniature robots to repair and rebuild them. These turrets weren't as effective against infantry, especially compared to the previous version of the turret, but they were still effective against vehicles. A fourth turret could even be added onto the central hub itself, further increasing the amount of firepower it could bring against targets. Though if the hub itself is destroyed, then all the turrets associated with that hub will also be destroyed. Near the end of the First Tiberium War, the Brotherhood were able to develop handheld laser weapons that infantry could utilize. However, due to the cost and power of these weapons, only certain Nod units were equipped with them. In particular were the elite Black Hand Chameleon and Heavy Weapon Soldiers, as well as Nod Officers. The first of these weapons was the Firefly Laser Rifle. This semi-automatic rifle was highly accurate and powerful, able to take out heavily armored infantry in just a few shots. The shock of being hit by the rifle's laser beam is enough to stun a person, preventing them from returning fire at the user for a short time. It also causes burning wounds due to the heat of the laser. Similar to the obelisk, the Firefly also uses a focusing crystal with which to fire its beams from. In-game, the rifle holds 100 rounds of ammo, but I don't believe that means actual ballistic rounds. I couldn't tell from the animation exactly how the weapon is reloaded, but I do have a few possibilities in mind. The first is that the focusing crystal on the front of the rifle is only good for about 100 blasts, and then needs to be replaced with a new focusing crystal. But if this is the case, then that would seem to imply that the crystals on top of the obelisks would also need to be periodically replaced as well, which there is no indication that they are. The second is that after 100 bolts, the weapon overheats and needs to be vented in order to cool off, so as to prevent parts of the rifle from melting due to the amount of internal heat. But if that's true, then the weapon should have unlimited ammo, which it doesn't, as the max amount of quote, rounds one can carry outside the weapon is 400. The last, and in my opinion most likely possibility, is that the rifle uses some kind of battery cell that is good for 100 bolts until it runs out of energy, thereby necessitating the need to replace that empty battery with a new full one. In that case, one carries with them four extra battery cells, if we go with the idea that one cell holds enough energy for 100 laser bolts and a battery cell being replaced is kind of what it sounds like when the gun is being reloaded. The second weapon was the Tarantula Laser Chain Gun, a large and heavy automatic weapon with three rotating barrels. This weapon was basically a machine gun variant of the Firefly, with a faster rate of fire while still being decently accurate. Unlike the laser rifle, which has a focusing crystal on the front of it, the chain gun didn't have one, at least not externally. Most likely it had the crystal contained internally within the gun itself. Perhaps it even had three crystals, one for each barrel. It also held 100 bolts. Though when reloading this gun, it actually kind of sounds like it's venting heat. This is evidence that, at least for this weapon, the reload is just it needing to be cooled before it can fire again. However, just like with the laser rifle, a soldier only carries a max of 400 bolts for the chain gun, which means it would make use of battery cells. Perhaps it's even a combination of both. The weapon requires a new battery cell, and while reloading, it is able to vent heat. After the First Tiberium War, handheld laser weapons weren't seen again in the Brotherhood's arsenal, at least not until the Third Tiberium War, where elite Nod commandos made use of laser handguns, which were powerful enough to kill any enemy infantry in quick succession. The handgun had cables that were attached to the bandolier, which the commando wore slung like a sash around her body, which meant she didn't have to worry about having to reload the handguns in the middle of a fight, if at all, as the bandolier acts as a battery pack for them. The commander's lethality is also increased with the use of a personal stealth generator, which allows her to stay hidden when not actively engaged with hostile targets. Of course, if the Brotherhood could figure out how to equip soldiers with laser weapons, then they could certainly outfit their vehicles with them as well. However, Nod didn't start adding lasers onto their vehicles until a few years after the Second Tiberium War, and not all of their vehicles were equipped with them, these upgrades came in the form of what the Brotherhood called Spitfire Laser Capacitors. 
Now, like commanders could order these upgrades if they felt they needed the extra firepower to help deal with hostile forces. These lasers could be seen replacing the machine gun of the Raider buggy, the machine gun on the Venom patrol craft, and the cannon on the Scorpion tank, with the laser being placed on the back treads of the tank in order to resemble a scorpion's tail. Now, it was later able to apply these upgraded capacitors to their defensive laser turrets as well. Some of Nod's more powerful vehicles automatically came equipped with lasers, the most recognizable ones being the Black Hand's Purifier War Mech, and later, the Avatar War Mech, which was used by Nod forces outside the Black Hand. And of course, the most powerful mech of all in the Brotherhood's arsenal, the Redeemer, whose main weapon was an obelisk-derived tripart laser on its right arm that could instantly destroy most vehicles and bring down structures in short order. The last laser-based vehicle in Nod's arsenal at the time of the Third War was the Beam Cannon. This small, six-wheeled buggy effectively acted as their own form of long-range laser artillery. The downsides of this vehicle were that it was lightly armored and could be easily destroyed, but it made up for that lack of armor due to its versatility. The buggy could use its laser to supercharge the capacitors of an obelisk of light, increasing the tower's firepower and reducing its recharge time with up to four beam cannons contributing to one tower. Multiple beam cannons can also combine their beams in order to generate one powerful beam to focus on a single target. The more cannons that contribute, the more devastating the combined single laser beam will be. The vehicle could also reflect its beam off mirrors mounted underneath Venom aircraft, extending its range, and the beam could even bounce off multiple Venoms. The last utility of the vehicle was that it could donate its cannon to an Avatar war mech giving it an extra laser weapon to attach to its left arm. The Brotherhood's mastery of laser technology has allowed them to keep up with the firepower and advanced weaponry of GDI. It also came in handy in helping to defeat the alien Skrin's invasion of Earth. The Brotherhood can only continue to improve their laser arsenal moving forward, allowing them to one day defeat the oppressors of the Global Defense Initiative, and hopefully stop a second possible invasion of Earth by the Skrin in the not-too-distant future.